K2, the Savage Mountain, is one of the most dangerous mountains in the world. In this video, we have collected some of the most terrible mountaineering stories that took place along its slopes. Let's not waste any more time and get to the heart of it. Steve Unk was a well-loved adventurer and mountaineer who had honed his climbing skills over the years. In 1994, Steve was ready to take on his greatest challenge yet. He, accompanied by three other climbers, were going to summit K2, etching his name in history as one of the few to do so. At the time, K2 was, like today, one of the more popular mountains to climb, so naturally, there were many expeditions underway to summit the famous mountain. When Steve and his teammates, David Bridges, Michael Groom, and Harry Taylor, reached base camp, there were plenty of climbers also waiting to begin their own journey. After all, they had chosen the month of July for their expedition, which is considered perfect for attempting a climbing due to better weather conditions compared to the rest of the year. The expedition, however, was far from being without any problems. The team had planned to ascend K2 via the Northwest Face Route, but before they began, they chose to instead take the Cessan route. There was heavy snowfall on K2, which had delayed their expedition significantly. The camps of various climbers got buried under deep snow. The routes to the summit themselves were also buried under quite a few feet of snow. This means that the ascend would be much more difficult as the softer snow would present a constant threat while also throwing off the group's navigation capabilities. Trekking through the increased layers of snow throughout the climb would also exhaust the climbers more. But Steven and his team powered on. They began their ascent and reached Camp 1, and then Camp 2. At Camp 2, another expedition consisting of five members was there as well. The name of the expedition was the Amical Alpine Expedition, and consisted of esteemed alpinists such as Rob Hall, Finn Vika Gustafsson, and Raja Ratit. Although Steven and his team did not know it yet, a tragedy would connect them with this expedition ahead of them on the climb. At this point, the brief relief of the weather was over. The weather once again worsened, hindering the group's progress instantly. So Steve and his companions chose not to climb any higher for that day. Michael Groom, however, did not want to wait. So when he heard that the Amical Alpine Expedition Group was going to continue the climb onward, even in the bad weather, he made a hard decision. He was going to join them and continue onwards. Michael and the Alpine Group reached Camp 3 without any incident. But when they reached their destination, they found their camps to be buried under around two meters of snow. This meant hours and hours of digging through the snow to get to their supplies. It took the group three hours to dig up the tents, doing constant hard work to ensure their survival. Then, after some rest, the team moved on to Camp 4, which they reached safely. Before going to rest in their camps, they made a very smart decision. They placed bamboo wands around the camp to mark their location in case of a snowfall covering the tents. In the next few days, heavy snowfall would once again present a serious threat. The weather was constantly bad and the expedition could not continue. The group was stuck at Camp 4 for five days. After this long wait and a fight for survival, finally the sky cleared up and the group ventured out again. They were able to progress all the way up to K2's bottleneck. Here, they saw a haunting sight. Two bodies hung above them by ropes, climbers who had died while attempting to climb. But there was no time to stay. They moved on. After more climbing, they finally reached the summit. It was a joyous occasion, but they had to begin descending soon due to the worsening weather. During the descent, they made it back down to where the bodies hung. They kept going down to the shoulder of the bottleneck and made camp. The next day, the weather became better once again, and they saw the bamboo poles they had set up as a sign nearby. With this, they were able to find their bearings and find where their tents were. They quickly got ready and descended further down, hoping to reach base camp safely. The weather kept becoming worse and worse as they reached Camp 3. Before they reached Camp 2, Michael twisted his knee. They stopped at the camp with some party members, continuing on to the base camp. There, they met Steven, and his team had informed them of Michael's predicament. Steve, being the kind-hearted person he was, chose to go and help Michael by getting him medicine 
and helping him to the base camp. Steve and David began their ascent up to Camp 2. They met with Michael there after a successful journey and gave him the medicine. Steve was a big guy, so he was assigned to carry Michael's bag, to which he did not complain and was happy to help. On their way down to the base camp, they came across various expeditions. Soon, they arrived at House's Chimney, a very dangerous part of K2 where you had to climb almost vertically. But as it turns out, a Korean expedition was climbing up the chimney. They were using the fixed ropes of the house chimney, which meant that Steve and his team had to wait. Steve did not want to wait. He tied a rope around himself and Michael. Then, Michael was lowered down. Steve saw some old ropes hanging down the house chimney left there by previous climbers. These ropes were old and had been there longer than the recommended time. But for some reason, Steve still attached himself to the old ropes. All the expedition heard then was a snapping sound. Steve plummeted down the cliff mid-descent as a rope broke. The Korean team and Steven's expedition members were left speechless at what had occurred. Steve had fallen and died to his death. The 800 meter drop meant no chance of survival. Steve's death was a great loss for the mountaineering community. Frederick Erickson was a well-respected climber who had a lot of experience climbing dangerous mountains, but what he specialized in was skiing down mountains that he had climbed. He climbed and skied the Smoil Simoni Peak, located in Tajikistan. He also did the same on the central summit of Shisha Pangma, becoming the first Swede to do so. In 2005, Frederick skied down from the summit of Gasherbrum II as well. Aside from that, he also did various climbs in Turkey, Iceland, Sicily, and Svalbard. From all of this, it is clear that he was passionate about mountaineering and loved the thrill of skiing down the slopes of the mountain he had worked so hard to climb. In 2010, he announced his upcoming attempt to climb K2, one of the most dangerous mountains in the entire world, and then skied down it all the way to the base camp. It would have been a great feat, as no one had done it before in history. For Frederick, it was a challenge worth the effort. K2, however, is known to be a very treacherous mountain to climb. Standing at 8,611 meters, it is the second highest mountain in the world. Also, it is one of the most deadliest due to its extreme difficulty, bad average weather conditions, and high mortality rate. Popularly known as Savage Mountain, for every four people who reach K2 summit, one person dies. Frederick understood the risk and still wanted to attempt the climb. He was confident in this expedition and knew that his years of experience in great mountaineering skills would be a big advantage in his favor during the climb. So, the expedition began. A summit bid was made by Frederick Erickson and his team, but the worsening weather conditions had made it impossible to continue. From the looks of it, K2 would go unclaimed in 2010. But luck was on Frederick's side. The weather suddenly cleared up and the temperature on the mountain increased. It was a perfect opportunity as the climb began, the team was making great progress. They reached Camp 1, Camp 2, and Camp 3 safely. However, during the climb, the warmer weather presented a new threat. The ice was melting, and chunks of rocks that had been held in place by the ice were coming loose. Soon, the party had rocks the size of balls raining down on their head, fairly often, as they tried to reach further up the mountain. It got so worse that by the time the expedition had reached Camp 4, everyone had to sleep in their tent with their helmet on just in case a stray rock came hurtling down the cliff and towards her head. Despite this added danger, things seemed to be looking great for Frederick and his team up until this point. They were confident that if the weather conditions remained good, they would be able to reach the summit and ski down as planned, becoming the first in the world to do so. However, the treacherous K2 had something else planned for them. On 6 August, the weather suddenly worsened. Only three members of the expedition chose to stay, and the rest decided to return, not confident that they would make it to the summit. The members who stayed were Ericsson, Cook, and Kaltenbrunner. Frederick and his remaining team pushed on with their expedition. The problem? It was a whiteout. Visibility was near zero. The team could only navigate based on their climbing experience and their immediate surroundings that they could barely see. Despite this, they were able to reach the area just below the bottleneck. Cook at this point was suffering from cold hands. A few weeks earlier, 
His hands had been frostbitten while establishing camp, so he had no choice but to turn back. This left just Frederick and Keltenbrunner to continue the climb. But soon, the tragedy struck unexpectedly. As he climbed, Frederick was ascending unroped. He wanted to place a peg to create a belay on a small outcrop to the right of the bottleneck. As he was placing a pitten, a rock dislodged. Suddenly, he was thrown completely off balance because of this unfortunate incident. Maintaining his position clinging to the mountain proved to be impossible. Gerling Keltenbrunner saw Frederick hurl past her down the cliff. There was nothing she could do to save him. Soon, he was out of sight. Gerlin did not give up hope for Franklin's survival. She started to make her way downward to look for him. However, soon it became clear that she could not hope to find Frederick's body in such bad weather conditions. So, she aborted her attempt at the summit and returned to Camp 4. Frederick had fallen from a great height. Rescue attempts were also impossible in the current weather conditions. So, he was presumed dead. His death was a great loss for the mountaineering community as he was an inspiration to many and a close friend to various mountaineers. Many people wanted to at least search for Frederick's body, but it was Frederick's father who decided not to continue the search effort. Placing others in danger to retrieve Franklin's body was not something he wanted, as someone else could possibly die during the retrieval. Frederick was left to rest on the mountain he wanted to be the first one to climb and ski down from. He lies resting with a view of the mountains he loved so much.